Welcome back. The return home that makes up most of Chapter 5 of Don Quixote, Part 1, reviews the identity crisis we saw in Chapter 1 when Don Quixote vacillated between Amadis of Gaul and Reinaldos de Montalban. Now our Hidalgo fixates on the Ballad of Baldovinos, which tells of when this knight was left for dead in the woods by the lascivious traitor Carlotto, Charlemagne's son, and then rescued by his uncle, the Marquis of Mantua. Don Quixote identifies with the wounded knight of the woods, lamenting his betrayal by his wife and Carlotto. Again, Don Quixote has oriented himself against the imperial Christian forces at Roncevalles. But what about the narrator? He mocks the madness of our hero, insisting that the story of Aldovinos is no truer than the miracles of Muhammad. This sounds like anti-Islamic commentary, but wait, every Muslim knows and every Christian should know that Muhammad never performed any miracles. So is the narrator saying that the miracles of Muhammad were false, or rather, is he scoffing at those who would falsify the life of Muhammad by claiming that the prophet performed said miracles? Regarding ethnic or religious identity, the narrator appears to be as unreliable as Don Quixote. And in the middle of this confusion, as Don Quixote recites the sad poem from the perspective of Baldovinos, we meet Pedro Alonso, a farmer, neighbor of his, who was returning from having deposited a load of wheat at the mill. Note how the farmer indicates the true identity of Don Quixote, Master Quijana, he calls him, and then he lifts him onto his ass. Note also that Don Quixote returns home not on Rocinante, but an anonymous ass. We'll try to underscore the ass theme, but it would be a good idea to start registering every appearance of this controversial animal. The narrator continues to emphasize the sorry condition of our hero. He is so milled and broken that he could not keep himself straight on the donkey. And so, nearly falling off the ass, the devil kept bringing to his mind stories that suited events. Suddenly, Don Quixote forgets Baldovinos and identifies with none other than the Moor Abindarraez, when the governor of Antequera, Rodrigo de Narvaez, captured him and brought him back to his domain. So the details of our narrative continue to draw a southerly trajectory. Don Quixote identifies with a Moor. The term alcalde, governor in English, is Arabic. Even Antequera, the place where Don Quixote is brought captive in his mind, is located in Andalusia between Cordoba and Malaga recalling the Miller's Daughter in Chapter 3. Clearly Cervantes envisioned the Moorish novel, a genre exemplified by the Abenterraje, a tale about the love between Abindarraez and Jarifa, which was added at the end of the Diana, a pastoral novel by Jorge de Montemayor, as integral to his own text. Just in case we have not been paying attention, Don Quixote himself explains the nature of his madness to his neighbor in clear terms. Your grace should know, Don Rodrigo de Narvaez, that this beautiful Jarifa I have just mentioned is now the fair Dulcinea del Toboso, for whom I have done, do, and will do the most famous deeds of chivalry that have been seen, are seen, and have yet to be seen in all the world. Hello, so Don Quixote is Abindarraez and Dulcinea is Jarifa. We are in the fifth chapter of a 52-chapter novel, and our milled Hidalgo from La Mancha is already a Moor and his lady a Morris. Did someone say blasphemy? Perhaps heresy, treason. Is our crazy hero diabolical? Of course, Don Quixote would object. In fact, when Pedro Alonso tries to clarify his identity, he answers resolutely, I know who I am. There is a serious lesson here about the ongoing instability of Cervantes' irony. Before, when our hero attacked the silk merchants for their blasphemy because they had no faith in the perfection of his mistress, did he already have this Dulcinea Jarifa in mind? And if so, then was he imposing orthodoxy and purity or defending heterodoxy and miscegenation? Now we are about to begin Cervantes' famous parody of the Inquisition, his clearest assault on the institution most dedicated to purifying Spanish identity, both ideologically and even in terms of bloodlines. Meanwhile, let us note three aspects of the conclusion of Chapter 5. The issue of conflict between orthodoxy and heresy continues to the degree that the narrator attributes Don Quixote's madness to the devil, and the housekeeper consigns the accursed books of chivalry to Satan and Barabbas, all in addition to a series of explicit references to the Inquisition. The niece insists on burning the wicked books of Don Quixote as if they were heretics, and the priest declares that a public act be performed and that they be sentenced to the flames. 
Second, also on the rise is the idea that our protagonist needs healing, for in his own words, he returns home gravely gashed, mal ferido in Spanish, and asks everyone to call upon Urganda the wise to cure and tend to his wounds. And according to the housekeeper, without that digger woman coming, we here know how to cure you. Three, and finally, the madness of Don Quixote seems to infect the discourse of the other characters. First, the niece reports that she has heard Don Quixote claim his sweat was the blood of the lesions, feridas, he had received in battle. Then Pedro Alonso announces that he has arrived with Don Quixote gravely gashed. And finally, the narrator himself deploys the free indirect style imitating Don Quixote when he speaks of his lesions, feridas again, and reports that Don Quixote claimed to have fought against 10 giants who were the most ferocious that one could find, fallar, anywhere on the face of the earth. Clearly, this outbreak of madness must be foreclosed forthwith.